So what I want to do is to talk about the scientific revolution. And so let's just make sure that we're oriented in time properly here. And notice that a lot of this overlaps, these dates overlap with um, segments that I've already talked about historically. So you want to keep this all straight and kind of think about, well, these are all, these things are all happening simultaneously. So for example, Nicholas Copernicus and, and the scientific revolution is sometimes called the Copernican revolution uh, because, and, and, it, and, and what I want to emphasize here is that a lot of the scientific revolution is conceptual and not just conceptual, but even uh, conceptual at the level of mathematics, that it's just about figuring out the mathematics. And um, now Nicholas Copernicus, very philosophical um, sort of conceptual turn as he says, well, what if instead of thinking as of the earth as the center of the universe as Ptolemy and all the Aristotelian scholastics thought because they thought of Ptolemy's work as, as the, the Almagest, the greatest work. Um, uh, Copernicus says, well, may, why do we assume that the earth is the center of the universe? Let's assume that the sun is the center of the universe. And maybe that makes more sense. And then he had arguments as to why that makes more sense. And so that's a big switch in the way of thinking about things. And it's really just a conceptual uh, difference. And then um, about 60, 65 years later, we have uh, Kepler, Johannes Kepler, who figures out the math to make the, uh, the data collected by the astronomers, uh, the astrologists, I've talked about this in the past, that astrology and astronomy weren't separated at this point. Um, so Kepler's working off of charts, um, uh, like Alfonso the astronomer um, had uh, created in, in Spain. Um, he's working off of charts like that, working off of data, and then he figures out the math to make the observed data fit Copernicus's model of the universe, where the sun's at the center and the earth revolves around the sun, uh, et cetera, and, uh, and, and gets it to work and, and uh, figures out uh, Kepler's, uh, uh, Kepler's law, as it's known. Um, and Galileo works out some things about gravity, you know, he says, hey, look, big, heavy objects and light objects fall at the same rate. Uh, but he didn't just demonstrate that. He also did the math and, and figured out um, the rates at which they are falling. Now, he didn't have a big explanation for this, but he's like, okay, at least we know this. And he also adopted, uh, you know, the Copernican view of the universe. And so he's thinking in these terms and he also made a lot of observation. Uh, he ground his own lenses and, and constructed his own telescopes in order to make uh, accurate and new discoveries, um, new observations of heavenly bodies. And, um, uh, and then Rene Descartes, uh, he has this discourse on the method of rightly conducting one's reason and seeking the truth in the sciences, a very philosophical work about methodology and how should we go about conducting ourselves in the sciences. Um, and in this book, he, you know, he says his most famous thing, uh, I think, therefore I am. So it is a very philosophical work dealing with metaphysics and consciousness and and, and things like that, um, and epistemology. I mean, that's really, it's a, an epistemological work about how do we know things or how do we go about knowing things? And um, uh, very conceptual. And then uh, at the end of the book, he has some appendices, which are like small treatises on their own, one on optics where he 
he uh, describes um, the optics of the eye and the op optic of lenses, like what Galileo is using, and uh, describes how those work, but also does the math. So he figures out the geometric uh, mathematical uh, properties of that. And, um, and he does some work on meteors. And I think he does get, does do some things on math there. I'm not as familiar with that word, but I think he does do some things. But, um, but one thing with the optics and, and the work on meteors is, and even the whole entire discourse itself, he does get a lot of the scientific facts wrong because this is at an early stage when a lot of things had not been tested and he's speculating quite a bit, but his math tends to work out okay, and that's that's good. But he does. There are in Rene Descartes' thinking, there are some key um, mathematical problems, but he lays everything out so clearly that the, those those problems can be found and then resolved in the coming decades. And one thing that he does in the algebra, one of the appendices in the Durst course on method, is um, he creates um, the x, y axis. So whenever you, you've done uh, math where you've done like the equation of a line, y equals mx plus b, that's entirely due to this work uh, by Rene, Rene Descartes from 1637. So we had a big jump in mathematics when Fibonacci introduced the Hindu Arabic numeral system. And that made uh, uh, helped jump up mathematics in Europe uh, quite significantly. And then Rene Descartes' algebra is another big jump uh, that really helps mathematics get off the ground. And what the algebra does is it connects geometry with algebra, like Al Khwarizmi that I've spoke about before, the Arabic. Uh, mathematician who um, who wrote the big book on algebra uh, around what was uh, 800 900 AD and um, and so what Hart figures out how to do is to connect algebra with geometry and harmonize those and, and that's that's very important especially if you're going to be um, talking about like the motion of the planets or even the motion of a projectile, right? And we're starting to get into the period now where we're starting to have gunpowder and, and projectiles on, on the battlefield. And so all of this stuff is becoming very important, like a life or death sort of situation. And Rene Descartes' algebra is a huge step into figuring out uh, projectile motion, and then also the motion of the sun and the moon and the stars and everything. Um, and Isaac Newton, uh, this is Newtonian physics, as we learn in high school. Um, you know, that book is also very philosophical and conceptual. It's not about observation. He's relying on the observations of earlier people, especially like Galileo. And, um, and of course, the uh, Kepler and what he did, but he wants to figure out that issue of gravity, which is really about force and, and defining force in a mathematical way so that we can make the mathematics fit the observations. And, uh, and he's able to do that by postulating some laws of motion. So he has these, these laws of motion that he concocts, and then he shows how if we assume those things, then we can make the mathematics work in a way that fits the observation of these, these earlier um, data sets. And, and that all is. And he solves a big problem, a big hole in Rene Descartes' um, mathematics, uh, because Rene Descartes' mathematics doesn't quite work because it doesn't account for force. And, um, and so uh, Isaac Newton solves that pu that puzzle that problem which was an obvious pu problem at his time now in, uh, in doing all this isaac newton has to um, invent calculus okay so this is another huge step in in um, in the progress of mathematics but a huge conceptual shift 
in the way we even think about mathematics. People had a really hard time even accepting that calculus was mathematics at, at the time. Um, but that's how we made it all work. And so he needed calculus to, to make the physics work. And, um, and so that's quite an accomplishment. But all this stuff is very conceptual. So that's kind of interesting. And it's interesting from a philosophical perspective, of course, okay. And then also in here is Robert Boyle, who uh, wrote the first book on chemistry. And, um, you know, in the full title of this work or, or like on the title pages, you know, he even advertises it as an explanation of alchemy. And that's really what Robert Boyle is doing is bringing uh, chemistry into existence out of alchemy, uh, you know, where people are trying to change lead into gold is the, you know, the, the typical example of what they're trying to do. Um, but um, the Aristotelians and other philosophers from earlier time periods in Europe were really struggling with trying to figure out chemistry and Boyle's uh, book just makes everything fall into place very nicely. So we have these like conceptual shifts, just like, oh, we're gonna look at it a little differently and then it all falls into place. Um, and that's a lot about what the scientific revolution is about. Now this is interesting historically because um, we tend to think of this as, a, as a, 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 a stage of progress that we're going upward and, and getting to a new level of things, a higher level. And, um, and so this notion of progress is gonna be very important for us as we look at Hegel and then Marx, you know, they both have a sort of undying belief in progress of always getting to a higher level. And a lot of that sense of progress comes out of the, the conceptual tweaks that the scientific revolution makes. And uh, so just be thinking about that. And, and this is stuff that's going on in the background. And I will, of course, remind you of that again when we look more closely at the philosophy. But I just want to keep on trying to, you know, it's hard to talk about these things all simultaneously. So we got to break it up into conceptual units. Uh, but really, these things are are all kind of laid on top of each other and happening, happening simultaneously. So <clears throat> uh, just keep that in mind and I will see you in the next video.